Hello and welcome to this bonus episode of Headstrong. This is hosted by me, Louis Strong, and I sit down with a variety of people in the public eye just to have a chat to them about their highs and lows. Now today's bonus episode is with the wonderful Jessica Power. I sat down with Jess over Zoom and we had a chat about Married at First Sight. Now, this show did come out over two years ago in Australia, but it is taking the British public by storm. And we had a chat about her experiences on the show, as well as what she's learned and how she's grown as an individual. So I really hope you enjoy this episode. Jessica, thank you so much for joining me on Headstrong. How's it all going? Hi, thanks for having me. Um, Look, it's all going... I feel like I'm back in 2019. Um, filming, I mean, you know, once the show's aired over here, it's so surreal having all of these opinions that everybody had so long ago all over again. <laughs> so where, where, where are you at the moment then? Because obviously you're on the other side of the world to me and it actually it's kind of 10 in the morning for me, so it's probably quite late for you. Yeah, so it's 8 o'clock at night here um, and I'm on the Gold Coast, so Queensland in WA. Love it. Where I, moved, it. Where I moved for Dan Webb, which, you know, I think everyone's seen how that's all worked out. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear. Now, where did you go? come from then? Because let's paint the picture because they're, they're from starkly different places from where you are from to where you are now, isn't it? Because I've been to Australia and the Gold Coast. Yeah, have you? Oh, yeah, it was, it was beautiful here. But I was, so I, I was born here on the Gold Coast but grew up in Perth. So I was there my entire life, my entire 28 years up until I moved to the Gold Coast again <laughs> for someone that I fell for on a TV show, which, you know, sizzled out quite fast. But that's okay. <laughs> Before we jump on to um, Married at First Sight, I, I just want to want to capture Australia at, at, at this moment because we're talking in February 2021 and it seems to be the only bloody place in the world that seems to be open. Yeah, well, see, we our restrictions have only really just, like they were, they were quite, um, you know, easy before but now all of our borders are back open we can drive so my dad for example lives it's only 40 minutes away from me but it's technically in New South Wales so I couldn't see him for so long and everything's opened up again we're able to travel you know around Australia Um, we're able to have like lunch we're able to go shopping the movie cinemas are open again like I didn't even I completely I miss those oh I know because you guys are in a full lockdown at the moment aren't you thanks for rubbing it in I know. Well, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm you joking. Get to being an absolute twat on TV. <laughs> no, we're good. Well, do you know what? As you say, Married at First Sight is the ultimate bingeable TV show, which is absolutely wonderful. Um, but let, before we dive into the, the the show itself, then I'm curious. Then I know that we're casting your mind back a, a few years, but what was your what was your impulse and decision to get on the show? Was it your friends? Were you egged on to do it? Go on. Uh, well, I was actually asked three years in a row by producers to do it. Uh, the first year they asked me, I was in a relationship. The year after, I just wasn't ready to really be with anybody. I was happy with my family, my friends, my job. I was chilled out, you know. And then by the third year, I thought, well, there's no one, you know, even remotely marriage material here and I hate my job and I'm bored so I'll chuck my name in the hat. I probably won't get on, but let's just see what happens. And then I think in the next two weeks I was getting married. I was like, what has just happened? That's but, hilarious. What's yeah, that? it was very, very fast. What, so what is that process like then? So you kind of, you got back to the producers, you said yes. And then what is it? A few phone calls, a few castings? Yeah, so for, so it, I went through the normal process that anybody else had to, you know, I filled in the application, got an email straight back, had to send in a video. I think I just sent in, I sent in a proper video, but I sent in all my bloopers, which I think probably, you know, interests them a little bit more. Then you get um, a Zoom call with the producers and then it's just back and forth flights to Sydney, which is, let's to, to put it into the, like, you know, the listener's perspective, uh, it's a five-hour flight. Yeah, it's and not I short. Was doing I was doing what, like, so I would be leaving Perth at 4 a.m. in the morning and then getting back to Perth at like 11 midnight or whatever, like in the one day just for a 20 minute uh, meeting. So I was doing that three or four times before they casted me. So you must have like then, you know, five hours there, five hours back. Like you must have like wanted it, I suppose, then enough, enough to be committing to, to doing that travel. 
Yeah, you know, it, well, it was in, it, it sort of intrigued me a little bit because my mm. because my personality has always been really bubbly and loud, and I and I love I don't love attention, but I, I'm always the loud one in the room. I've always been the class clown. I've always been the girl that you know never really paid attention because I thought something else was funny. So I just it was sort of a big grind, a bit of a trip for me. Um, and then it sort of bubbled down to actually we okay we found a. a you know, a match for you. And that's when my brain went, holy hell, what is happening? And yeah, it was, it was crazy. It was a crazy ride. It still is. It's been three years on and my name still is constantly on, you know, articles in magazines, just the crap that gets made up as well. My dad just asked me about four or five times, are you pregnant? I'm like, no, I'm dad. Yeah, so, I mean that's the glory, the glory, and also the the disaster of reality TV to an extent that rumors fly. Hmm. So much, it was crazy. Oh, geez. But it's all right. You take it in your stride, and I laugh at most of it. <laughs> well, you've got to take it lightheartedly. If you start taking it personally, that's when your your own demise will happen, I suppose. A hundred percent, especially somebody like me. I think when my season started, uh, sorry, just finished airing here, my publicist said to me, Jessica, just so you know, your face is probably one of the most recognized recognized faces in Australia, and also the most hated. <laughs> Oh, how charming! So I didn't, I didn't really like, I didn't really grasp uh, what she meant until I went out to a bar or something with my friends, and I couldn't move two steps in front of me without just people. It was literally it got to a point for a while where I had to get security because I could, I, I couldn't go anywhere. Not people were ne- never nasty or horrible, but just wanting photos and oh my god! And it was, it's very strange going from just normal day to day Jess to like people knowing you. So you got security, did you? Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, because I would, because when I would do appearances or things, people would grab or, you know, and, and, it, and it was always in a nice way and I understand their excitement, but it sometimes can get really scary. And I'm really short. I look really tall on that TV show, but I'm really, really short and I'm t- like petite, tiny, tiny. So imagine me getting grabbed by like two, three hands. I'd just be like, ugh, into the ground. <laughs> Let's have so, a look at the, le- the legitimacy then of, of the show. Because of course it is a TV show and everything about it is glorified for, for the viewer. Um, but I want to I want to go straight to the actual legitimacy of the marriage. Where where are we there? Actually, you know, do you sign in contracts and pieces of paper that says this is legit, or is it just an experiment and it's just kind of married, so to speak? On in inverted commas, there for the listener. Yeah. Uh, well, it's actually illegal in Australia to um, on a television show uh, have a legal wedding. So we, it's technically like a commitment ceremony, I'd say. I know in the US they actually do sign the, the, the marriage contract, which is crazy. I, if I'd known that, I, I would never, I would never yeah. do it. Because, I mean, I know it's an experiment and I know people love it and I know they, they're like, you know, you're married, but marriage is very sacred. And if like, I wouldn't just go throwing that away with someone just for a TV show and who I didn't know. So yeah, it's not it's not legitimate. And once the ceremony is over, it's basically just the um, reception after that. They really want to get the juicy parts in because everyone gets a few drinks in them. Exactly. Now that is something that I did notice about the show, and particularly also <laughs> at the dinners as well, when all the, all the couples were there as well. You know, you don't often see a shot without a waiter in the background pouring some wine or something. Um, it, would you say that that certainly encouraged some of the feuds then? Well. This is funny, like not many people know it, but I get a little bit rowdy or like mouthy on dark spirits. And the producers sort of picked up on that like midway through um, me filming. So I was the only one that was allowed to have like a rum and coke and they would have it at my at my placement at the dinner table for when we walked in because they just knew because uh, and because I'm going to drink it. And the second they knew I had a few of those in me and I'm tired, I'm upset, I hate my husband, I don't want to be here anymore, I'm just going to kick off. Yeah. (laughs) Such a young Jess, young silly Jess. (laughs) Jess, how old were you when you were on the show? I was 27, so I'm I'm 30 this year. Did you feel... I suppose, did you, did you genuinely feel like ready to go on that? Because I, as you say, like if you'd been gone on two years before, I imagine like it would have been a completely different and it might, might have even been more um, like, you know, explosive to an extent. Because, um, mm. you know, with, with age comes, um, I suppose, more level-headedness and maturity and, 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 you know, be able to hold yourself, perhaps not when the dark spirits are around though. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, um, I don't know, I... 
felt that it was ready, but you know what, you know what it is? Like everyone's like, Oh, you know, you're only there for Instagram and you're only there to sort of boost your profile. Now I'm not a silly girl. I, I, I did go on with a small sliver of hope that potentially I could find somebody that I could fall in love with. And I did, it didn't work out, but that's so fine. But also I knew what a reality TV show can do to anybody. Um, I did not expect the airtime or the attention I got, but I, I did see it as an opportunity as well to, you know, potentially boost my business adventures in, in the future, be able to build myself a platform. And now I, you know, I, I took it and I, you know, all of the bad scrutiny that I've got back, but I've, I've taken it, I've ran with it and I've built such an amazing, you know, life for myself. So I probably wasn't ready to get bloody married. But it also taught me to grow up a lot as well because it showed me all of my really bad traits, all of my poor behavioural traits, and I got to actually see it and see how people reacted to it as opposed to my friends sort of going, don't worry, Jess, like, who cares? And I had to grow up. So, yeah, it was it was good in a way. I think, yeah, you're absolutely right. You've got to, you do have to take out the, the pros of, of a show like that, particularly when it's being aired to a nation and now indeed the world. And that's quite scary to say as well I suppose but you know upon reflection you can go actually do you know what I, I you know you were probably blaming people here and there throughout the show but actually you can look at yourself and reflect on it and that's a really important lesson sometimes 100% you know I, I, I sat there and went okay so my my actions actually do hurt people and it's not and even if I don't see that person ever again or if that person doesn't really mean much to me it's still it is still such a poor character trait character trait to have um but yeah, who the who then are you still in touch with? Am I? I'm, I'm curious. Um, so Tamara and I are still really good friends. Uh, she was over here not long ago having dinner. Dan and I are really good friends. It took us a long time after our breakup in order to have that level of you know respect for one another, as we just know what what the other person's like now. We we have a really good friendship. I still talk to Mike. I still talk to Nick. I still talk to Heidi here and there. There's quite a few of them, you know, it, it isn't as like volatile or, you know, abrasive as it seems. All of our relationships seem on the TV show. We actually all really do like each other. Martha and I are still really good friends. Well, the glory of TV is that they can literally edit into a 40 minute show what they want you to see and they can script it as they want. And so it's something particularly that I want to talk to you about in terms of the scripting was when you, you did go and potentially, again, Dark Spirits might have been involved, but when you went off and you told, um, um, what's his name? Yeah. yeah, no, 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 no. Previously, you know, yeah. I'm afraid. I know, of course I do, but you know, I'm just curious. That's just pushed by producers. I have no doubt. I am, you know what, you're the second person from the UK. You guys must be really bright over there. The second person to say you can so see that that was pushed by producers because what had happened, which you didn't see, everybody's seen the fight that happened with me, Martha, uh, Nick and Cyrell down in, the, uh, in Martha's room. And then they made it out like it was you know, that's a few days between and then there was a dinner party. But what actually happened was the fight happened that night. The next day was a dinner party and my producer said, why don't you go and ask Nick how he's doing? And I was like, what for? And she said, just go and see how he's doing. You know, it was a really rough day yesterday. His wife's, you know, went completely off the rails. So I was like, oh, Nick, come have a chat with me. And then I was saying to him, you know, how are you doing? He's like, yeah, I'm good. I said, well, you know, yesterday was pretty rough. Um Basically, they just cut and edited it and, like, cut out all the parts. Because I remember when Nick sang laughing and he and I was like, what are you laughing at? He's like, I've never been hit on like this. I said, I'm not hitting on you. I'm asking how you are. You're a great guy. And along the way, I've developed feelings for you because you're a great person. I want you to be with someone that makes you happy. And Cyril clearly doesn't make you happy. And after the they finished filming that and we were um, able to walk back into the dinner party, he actually turned around and, like, looked at me and put his fingers up. Like, just as, like, that was our, like, banter with one another just to go, ha, 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 like, stitched up. But we never expected what came out. And I remember sitting down at the reunion, and you guys haven't seen this yet, so it's a bit of a spoiler, but um, they show that conversation between Nick and I, and then the group says, do you feel like Jessica hit on you? And he said seven or eight times, no, I don't feel like she hit on me. And then it got for our executive producer to come out and say, Nick, I don't care how long we have to fucking sit here for. You are going to say you felt hit on because it shows on the show, it shows in that edit that she looks like she's hit on you. And so he felt so terrible. And I actually remember looking over at him just going, 
whatever, who cares? Not expecting like the out, like the, it just like backfired on both of us. And he's cleared it up in the media already. That was years ago, he cleared it up. <clears throat> he messaged me tonight actually saying, hey, hey, bud, how you doing? But um, it's just crazy how sometimes the editing can make you look so toxic. But at the end of the day, I'm never someone to blame editing or producers because it still came out of my mouth. Those actions were still mine. However, the little nice things or the buffer in between those things happening uh, just get cut out. <laughs> so yeah. Just like... uh, no, it's just it is, it's, it's astounding, really, because I'm sure that every single person, and you have no doubt, is absolutely lovely. It's just the way that it's, ju- it's just been created and, and the way that the producers want to edit it because ultimately they want as many views as possible themselves and then you're not going to get a view with 10 happily ever after marriages, are you? Exactly, and and they, they're creating a reality TV show for your entertainment. It's not yeah. supposed to be like rainbows and butterflies and you know if there's if the whole show was about you know cam and jewels everyone would be like oh this is bloody boring isn't it everyone wants to see whose whose relationship jess is going to try and screw up next or what's what's coming out of their mouth i used to sit at those dinner parties because we'd film them for 14 hours and i'd go i so want to go home so i would sit there and go what can i do to just end this dinner party so i just drop a bomb and then the producers would come out and say, dinner party over. And I'm like, thank God, we've only been here for 15, 14 hours. Go on, what, would you, what did you say then? Oh, I would say just the stupidest things like, oh, Ning, do you know that Mark's been lying to you? But which, which was true. It was true. That really annoyed me when that came out because everyone's like, I can't believe you tried to, um, you know, hurt their relationship. My, uh, Mick, my husband, told me that about Mark. And it all got back to them that, that night. Heidi went back and told Mike what was said at the girls' night about um, what I said to Ning about Mark's relationship with her being fake. And so Mike got straight on the phone to Mark and then Mark got straight on the phone to Mick and they all venomously denied it the next day at the dinner party. And because I was already the little troublemaking shit stirrer, no one believed me. And that's why I sat there just going, you know what, I'm really sorry, I shouldn't have said anything because I was just, I'm, I'm not going to defend myself to people that, you know, uh, that everyone would put on this face on camera, but I was just always me, <laughs> which I probably should have learnt to put a face on, so it wasn't just always me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I, I, there's something that the headstrong captures is uh, going a li- diving a little deeper about the show. Now you are a lovely, bubbly personality, but I just want to talk to you about um, some of the behind the scenes things and the support that a, a show like that has on offer. Because you know there are true emotions there, and that they can hit you pretty hard. And in the era, particularly over here in the UK of of Love Island and the unfortunate circumstances surrounding the loss of a loss of some of these stars, what sort of infrastructure mm-hmm. is in, in place for your support, emotional support, you know, during the show and also after? Because you said that you were painted to be this villain, and I have no doubt there were probably days where you were not, you know, not enjoying the the backlash to an extent. So I was just wondering what that infrastructure was like. No, so, so I, I was really thick-skinned the entire way and I had a really great support system. But the one time where it did get to me, and I actually, this is widely known in media as well, I actually had, um, I got a Xanax addiction and I was drinking like a bottle of wine a day. This is after my life broke up with Dan on TV because not only had I moved my whole entire life somewhere for, for, for a man, I was already getting, you know, slammed online from people watching the show. Then everybody got to watch my life break up. So I was getting all of that plus, haha, sucked in, you deserve this, and then heartbreak. You know, so it was that to me was just too much enough. Like that, that, that was a lot for me. And I um, was not okay. I really was not okay. And we did have, we do have, um, you know, counselors and things that you can reach, that they can reach out to you and, and you can speak to if you like um I'm just lucky I had I have got such a great family that I could just lean back into but you do have a lot of support however sometimes I, I don't know I, I I don't I really think it's very um you know it's very like robotic their help and I'm doing like little air quotes as well like their help is a little bit robotic just just going off from what you've said there, just exploring that um, that time and the love and support that you do have and that you do receive, which is immensely important. Is that what you said got you through that those difficult times after breaking up with Dan and, and indeed going through that your period of addiction? Yeah, it definitely did get me through it. And, and it made me really quite aware of how dark and horrible the internet can be, which is why I'm now such a massive advocate 
for online bullying and like I, I, I'm auctioning my char- my wedding dress off to a charity here in Australia for a camp which supports <clears throat> children from the age of 14 to 18, <clears throat> sorry, um, and it just helps them to sort of understand like their world and, that you know, that they come from poor homes or they come from be- being bullied at school because if I was, you know, a young kid that went to high school and was bullied my entire life, come back home to, you know, a, a father that was a drunk or a mother that was a drunk and then had a poor home life and got on my inter- on the internet on my phone or whatever and was getting nasty, horrible messages, this is why people hang themselves or why they hurt themselves. The internet is such a dark, horrible place and people don't understand the weight of their words and how effective it can be in someone's life and they don't care either. And it's it really it really was a bit scary, and I was very grateful that I did have good family and friends around to, you know, hold on to me when I was in my darkest times. So I, I reached out to you via social media. Then, how do you mm. yourself kind of uh, manage that yourself? Then, because of course my my message is going to be it was quite you no know, you know nice and reaching out to you, but I'm I'm sure that you know nine, one out of a hundred there may well be some some nasty comments and trolling. How how do you? tackle that and how do you cope with that yourself and how does that make you feel how do how does that make you feel as well well when the show when it first happened and the show finished airing and I was getting these messages I would meticulously be on my phone replying to these trolls trying to just explain myself and 99% of the time I would be able to turn their opinions around but it's gotten to a point now where you know I get about two to 300 messages a day, probably let's say about 20 of those are negative. And I just block and delete now. I don't, I don't even read it. I don't even read it. I block and delete. My, my social media assistant messages me sometimes going, how the hell are you like dealing with today? And I'm like, what do you mean? And she's like, some of the inboxes and the comments and stuff you're getting, I said, just, I'm just block and delete, block and delete. I don't even give it a time a day because these people don't care about your opinion they don't care about your argument they just want the attention and it's online people like that that I just don't have time for so I just give all of my energy into the positive people on my social media but also the people that are actually around me in my real in my real day-to-day life like you know as much as I love my fan base and I think they're excellent the 233,000 followers that I have aren't going to you know be there at four o'clock in the morning when I'm upset over something the people that are my friends and my family are there and this is what people need to understand is that the internet is just the internet. It is not real. These people are not your friends. These people do not matter. Um, you, you, it's Their opinions shouldn't really get to you as much as it does. But some people, it, it you know, really hits home. But I just kind of laugh and I feel sorry for them. And also it's most of the time is women with, with children that comment nasty things. And I just go, I just hope to God your son or daughter never goes on a TV show when they're older and makes a few mistakes because they're young and, you know, in this high-pressure environment and cops the level of message I've just got from you because it's freaking disgusting. So. Yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't raise your, your – do, do that to your own child. So you should really kind of – it's manage, just really condescending it. yeah. and it's and it's like it's contradicting really like i say that, like i say that these people that are getting a lot of people from the uk messaging me and they're like you're a vile nasty bitch rah, rah, rah. i hope you get sh- like killed and all these things and i say you know what i'm really sorry but you are only lowering yourself to the person that you have just watched on a tv show like you're, you're worse than me on this show right now by sending this message do you mm. not realize that and that's when they kind of get it and they're like, oh, sorry. The amount of sorries I've gotten today is just strange. If, if you don't have anything nice to say, just don't say anything. Exactly. I, that, that, that's what it boils down to with trolling as well. It's like, what are you actually achieving by saying that? You know, you're wasting your own life. Okay, if, ultimately, if you don't enjoy the show, turn the thing off. But to, yeah. to, to actually get to a point of reaching out to somebody that you don't physically know to just insult them, it's just completely disrespectful and a waste of time. It's insane. You know, I, I don't think I've ever once woken up and gone, you know what, I'm going to get on the internet today yeah. and mess with someone who I don't know, something really nasty because it's going to make my day so much better. Like, what? Where is your headspace at? Well, Jessica, now I've got to ask you, what, what's, what's, what does the future hold then? What, 2021, what's, what's the goal? Look, I am studying my dual qualification in specialised skin and beauty. So I'm wanting to open up my own salon here on the Gold Coast, um, possibly more TV, possibly some um, hope, like TV hosting. I have a partner now as well. So who knows what could happen? 
and I saw you look over there. It's just going. I know, I know. Because I always, <laughs> say, I always say, "Honey, where's the ring? When are we having kids?" And we've just only met. But, yeah. dare, dare, he, dare he answer that one? Yeah, jeez. I'm, I'm on thirty this year. I'm not getting any younger. He's la- He's smiling right now. <laughs> well, we'll take that as a maybe. Hmm. Definitely. Um, so I ask this question to every guest that comes on, Jessica. What does the word headstrong mean to you? Headstrong to me, oh, why, why, for some odd reason when I think of headstrong, I think about my little brothers and sisters and how I am a sort of a martyr to them. Headstrong to me is belief in yourself, belief in your, your ideas and what you're doing and staying true to yourself, I would say. Lovely. Well, look, I wish you all the very best. Thank you so much for this uh, late call-up, so to speak. Um, I've really enjoyed it. And everybody, I think the show's still going on here in the UK. Um, but yes, the, the thing that we, we desperately want now, which we won't get for two years, is the reunion. But hey, hey. No, oh, you guys are getting it the week after um, the season ends. Oh, go my, on. My, yeah. Give me, give, me a, give me a spoiler. <clears throat> well, let's just say you'll see a lot of personal growth from Jess and somebody gets doused in wine. Ooh, there we go. That's good. That's good enough for me. All right, Jess, thanks so much. Thank you so much. Have a lovely day. And that's it for this bonus episode of Headstrong. Thank you so much to Jessica for joining me on Zoom and Zooming in from Australia and also coming in last minute to join me on Headstrong. I really appreciate it and her time. Now, I also hope that you really enjoyed that episode. And if you did, feel free to share it with your family and friends. Hit subscribe and also give us a rating. Every little helps. There's also plenty of other episodes in the catalogue of Headstrong. So feel free to go have a listen now. Join us on Monday for a new episode.